Is the mic on? Yes. Great. I probably don't need it. I'm a loud talker. If I talk too loud, you can kind of do this. Um, I want to talk to you today, as I understand most of you are students, and I want to talk about life at a crossroads. I sort of stole the title from my kids' high school because they're at Crossroads. But the metaphor really stuck with me because I think coming out of school, sorry, I'm messing with this because it's reverbing. Coming out of school, I think a lot of people don't really know what they're supposed to be doing. And I just wanted to give you some framework for thinking about how to make life choices. So life at a crossroads. Before giving you my personal stories, I would start by the fact that I'm a VC. I'm paid to hand out money. Um, that makes me pretty popular, <laughs> maybe for all the wrong reasons. And I know you probably have heard a little bit about venture capital. You may have seen these folks before. They run a show called Shark Tank. Uh, I actually encourage my kids to watch it. I have a 13-year-old and a 16-year-old. It just gets them thinking about the ideas that come up in business, like margin, channel, distribution, giving away equity, raising money. And sometimes I take calls in my car on the drive to school. I drive them to school every day. And uh, I'll be talking with an entrepreneur, and I'll hang up, and my son will say, why didn't he take a licensing deal? You're taking too much equity. And um, in our industry, a lot of people criticize Shark Tank, but I think it's really helpful, even though it's not that realistic. And just so you know, for each five-minute or four-minute or three-minute segment, they actually film for like an hour and a half, and they just condense it down. So they actually ask a lot more realistic questions than you get a sense of. Uh, the biggest difference between us and the guys and women that you see on Shark Tank is we give away real money. So when I wrote this deck, we had invested about $30 million in a company called Bird. Has everyone heard of Bird? Definitely ride Bird, hometown. Don't ride that, those other false scooters. Um, by now, we've actually invested more than $40 million in Bird. And I can answer questions about Bird. I'm going to save time for questions, so I'll answer questions at the end, and I'm just going to try to make sure I track the time so I save enough time for questions. Uh, does anyone know Goat? Well done. Nice. Uh, so Goat just raised $100 million from a company you might have heard of called Foot Locker. Uh, Goat sells hundreds of millions of dollars of stinkers now per year. I can't tell you the exact figure. It's a lot. When we invested, they had been selling zero sneakers. In fact, their first company we invested in wasn't even a sneaker company. It was a restaurant reservation booking company. I can answer that story if you ask at the end. Uh, but by now, we've invested north of $20 million in GOAT. We also invested in another company called Ring. Have you heard of Ring? Does anyone know Ring? OK, awesome. Um, I bring all these companies up because they're all Los Angeles-based companies. They all have created hundreds and hundreds of jobs, millions of dollars in our local economy. When we funded Bird, they also, uh, Ring, sorry, they also had zero sales. In fact, they went on Shark Tank, and Shark Tank said no. And I can also tell you stories about that if you ask at the end. Uh, but we sold to Amazon for north of a billion dollars. They bought the company. Uh, we also invested in a company you haven't heard of, I'm guessing. Has anyone heard of Appeal Sciences? Oh, amazing. Two hands went up. I didn't expect that. You're going to hear a lot about them, I hope. We met a young kid. By young, I meant coming straight out of his PhD program. He invented a way to take molecules out of the stems of plants and create a film that coats the plant. And what it does is it seals in moisture. It prevents oxidation, so it prevents the plant from spoiling. 
and it fools bacteria into thinking the whole plant is a stem, and then bacteria doesn't attack it because it thinks that it's a stem and there's no nutrients in the stem. So we get about three weeks extra yield on crops with no herbicides, no pesticides, and no refrigeration. So you can see an example. This is a real example on strawberries of strawberries treated with and not treated with appeal. And if you go on YouTube, there's a whole bunch of videos that you can see. But we now have nationwide distribution agreements with Costco, Whole Foods, Target, Kroger, Walmart, every major player. Uh, we've raised about $125 million in total, and we funded it straight from it just being an idea. It doesn't always work out that way, um, but that's what we do. We take bets on entrepreneurs Usually when we believe that they have an idea, capability, and leadership skills to do something extraordinary. And if I were to say, what is one common thread across those four companies, that's what it is, is leadership and uh, extraordinary abilities. Even in the case of GOAT, where it didn't start as a sneakerhead marketplace. Uh, we funded a company I'm certain you haven't heard of, please. Uh, Bionaut, has anyone heard of Bionaut? That would be crazy. Um, no, you haven't, good. Um, well, not good, but uh, Bionaut, what they've done is they've invented a way to, take, to create micro robots. So it's 100 microns small, so it's smaller than a human hair. They inject it into your body and then they use magnets to push it through tissue. And we have three primary uses for it. One is micro dosing of opioids with the intent of treating chronic pain where the opioid doesn't go to your brain and therefore doesn't lead to addiction. The second is micro dosing of chemotherapy. So if you need to treat liver cancer, kidney, lung, ocular, or even brain in the case of glioblastoma. The solutions for uh, releasing chemicals into your body are not very good. They have to blast your whole body. And using micro robots, we can precision deliver chemotherapy. We also believe that we can do micro extraction so they can go to a specific spot on a tumor and begin to extract. And it's a little bit scary when you think about it, the ability to send like armies of robots through your body using magnets in a way that you can't even control. It's kind of mind boggling, um, but we'll have profound outcomes if it works. So right now we're in what's called in vivo trials. So we've spent a year testing it on live animals, on rats. And we have to prove that we can draw precise shapes in their liver and then be able to demonstrate that there's no liver damage. Very promising company. Um, if it succeeds, I think we'll have wonderful outcomes. Just examples of people who have passed away terribly from glioblastoma, Joe Biden's son, Senator McCain, Senator Kennedy, all dying of glioblastoma. Um, and if there were easier, better ways to treat uh, the brain and move stuff through tissue, that would be an advantage. And we also get to do some pretty cool stuff. There's a company based out of France called In In Motion. And what they've designed is a system that uses explosives when you ride a motorcycle in a subfraction of a subfraction of a second to explode and have an airbag for a motorcycle when you're thrown off the motorcycle because the number one cause of death now on motorcycles is no longer brain injury, but it's thorax, because almost everybody on motorcycles now wears helmets. So we've had seven high-speed accidents north of 100 miles an hour, seven, and zero fatalities, 100 miles an hour. So they started in um, motorbike racing. They then developed an algorithm for street motorbikes. They're right now mostly only live in Europe. They designed an algorithm for downhill skiing. The French Olympic team wore it in the Olympics in Pyongyang. And we now have an equestrian version. The equestrian ver version is um, less adapted, so that is not commercially available yet. 
It's a very early stage company, but what excites me about it is the possibility that we could, this is, I don't know if the company will go this way because it's the entrepreneur who decides, not the investor, but my passion for it is hips and shoulders. And if we could develop a unobtrusive way for seniors to protect themselves when they fall, because it's one of the sources of decline in uh, aging people. Uh, so we've just given them $3 million. This is the start. They're based in, uh, I never say it right. If any of you are French, I apologize, but Annecy. Uh, it's a city near Grenoble, uh, near the French Alps. So we invest about $100 million a year. We manage about a billion and a half total. I run the firm. I'm 50. I know I look much younger. <laughs> um, so I kind of thought it might be interesting to say, how the hell did I get here? What did I do? And to start, I thought I would give you some thoughts about me and therefore your journey. So this is me at 18. I like beer. Um, but this is me, sorry, that was a bad joke. Uh, a <laughs> few people got it. Um, this is me at 18 buying my first legal beer. And uh, it used to be that you could buy beer when you were 18 in Hawaii, and this is my first trip to Hawaii. But I didn't really want to point out the beer, I wanted to point out the t-shirt. And that t-shirt is my first startup. I founded it when I was 16. I used to play basketball. Uh, my parents should have probably explained to me that it helps to be tall when you play basketball. So I was actually pretty good, but at the age of 16, they closed down a local high school and they combined two high schools and I all of a sudden found myself playing left out. And uh, so I started a booster club called the Rio River Rats. I went to Rio Americano in Sacramento, <clears throat> in Carmichael, if you know it. And uh, I decided to create a t-shirt, and you can see it here. There's a little river rat on it. There's RA, which is our school, Rio Americano, my high school graduation year, 1986. And I sold these t-shirts several hundred dollars at a time, which back then was kind of a lot. And I decided that if I could put the name on the back, and so I started with mine. I just put Dr. Seuss, my last name being Seuster. And then people would pay for letters to get their own name on it. And I sold them for about $1.50 a letter. It cost me about 10 cents a letter. So I made most of my profit selling letters of people wanting to build their names. So I ran this business for two years. <clears throat> when I left, another guy took over for me. He ran it for another two years. And then it got kicked off campus and became made illegal because they suddenly figured out what was actually on the t-shirt on the river at was probably stuff shouldn't be on there, uh, promoting drinking beer and other things we did in the 1980s. Um, but that was my, I don't know why I did it. I didn't really need the money. I wasn't rich, but I didn't need the money. I made a lot more money as a waiter in a restaurant, but I just got, I had this like urge to do something entrepreneurial and everything that I learned through my experiences in life was mostly by doing. And then over time you start to realize when you try things and you have little experiments that you actually learn skills from them. So uh, I want to tell you just six stories of things that I learned by doing sort of the hard way and maybe some life lessons. And I'm not checking text message. I'm keeping track of time. The first is, if you don't ask, you don't get. This is something my mom taught me from the youngest age. If you don't ask, you don't get. I had worked at Anderson Consulting. It's now called Accenture. I was a software programmer. I had done this for several years. And I don't know why I got the bug in my head that I wanted to live and work in Europe. That was the first crossroad in my life. It was 1994. In 1994, uh, when you were deeply technical as I was at the time, a lot of my friends were quitting to do startups. There weren't really startups back then because the internet wasn't a thing back then, but people went and they joined software companies. And I had a lot of friends that quit to join software companies. And I just decided I wanted to live and work in Europe. So I started trying to find ways to live and work in Europe. And I couldn't get <clears throat> anyone to hire me there. Nobody needed an American who didn't speak any foreign language fluently. Um, and in the, late the early 90s, we were in somewhat of a recession. It was harder to get jobs. So I found out about this office in the south of France 
at my company at Anderson Consulting, and I kept calling people and asking them if they would consider bringing me over. I actually flew out to France, hung out with some young people, went out at night, started asking how they got there, because I figured if I found local people who knew how to do what I wanted, in fact, uh, I can't remember, is it Will? Is Will in here? Will. Will came up to see me before this talk, and he asked how to get into venture capital. And uh, what did I say, Will? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not that. I said, go network with a lot of young people who can tell you how to get in, right? That was the second thing. Okay, thank you. That was the second. So two things. One is there are a lot of ways. Two is network with young people. So I went and networked with a bunch of young people. And they all told me that there's one person who makes the decision, and his name is Corey Van Wovler. Except I couldn't get Corey to meet me. So I started asking them for help. I got my spies on the ground, and I said, tell me when Corey's coming to the US. So I found out a date. He was coming to Chicago. Chicago was the headquarters of Anderson Consulting at the time. And so I contacted him. We used to use something called voicemail before email was a big deal. It was uh, a system called Octel, if there's any old people in the room. And I sent him a voicemail, and I said, Corey, I heard you're going to be in Chicago. What a coincidence. I'm going to be there, too. I wasn't actually lying. I was going to be there. I just didn't tell him it was conditional upon him agreeing to meet me. <laughs> so I said, uh, here's when I'm going to be there. I'm going to be such and such dates. Uh, I don't know. I'll make it up September 5th, and I'm going to be at O'Hare on that day, and then I'm going to be in the... He said, what a coincidence. I'm going to be there roughly the same time. I said, well, why don't we meet at the airport? He said, great. So we met at the airport, Chicago O'Hare. We had a couple of beers, and I kept telling him, look, I've been trying to get on your calendar. I've been trying to get to France. I'd really like a job there. And he said, well, we don't have any jobs open right now. And I said, I know, but listen, I know how to do distributed systems, computer programming. I've got skills from California, I think it'd be relevant. He was an American, by the way, um, of Irish descent. And he said, well, we don't need more Americans. And I said to him, well, listen, I'm pretty good at sales. I think I could help sell myself on a project and it wouldn't cost you anything. He just kept putting up obstacle after obstacle for every idea I had of why he had to take me. And believe me, I had rehearsed a bunch. He had obstacles of why he couldn't. And at the very end of it, I said to him, listen, Corey, there's one person who's in the way of an ambition that I have in my life, which is to live and work in Europe. You can say yes. If you do say yes, I will work my ass off to make sure you never regret it. If you say yes, I promise you, I will get myself placed on a job and not make you regret it. And you have the ability to actually change my life. So what are you going to do? <laughs> it's a true story. He said to me, you are such a pain in the ass. <laughs> Fine, you can come. And like that, he changed my life. I spent the next 11 years in Europe. The red uh, uh, stars are the places that I actually lived and worked. The white stars are places that I did projects. And just like that, he could have said no. I was pushy a little bit. I had this thing, chutzpah. Nobody in Europe even knows what chutzpah means, so I always had to explain it to people. The Brits used to say, oh, Mark has such chutzpah. Um, <laughs> but I'm also pretty nice about it. Um, and I wouldn't accept no for an answer. And frankly, I thought the worst case scenario is he tells me no. I'm not going to be a jerk, but if he tells me no, then it's no, and my life is no worse off other than a price of Chicago O'Hare. So I traveled. I worked all over Europe. After doing that for several years, after living in multiple countries, I don't know why, I had this like bug that I wanted to go and live and work in Japan. I don't know why. I grew up in California. There were a lot of Japanese people around me. People didn't really go to Japan back then. It wasn't, I mean, people did, but it wasn't a big thing. But I just thought I want to live and work in Japan. So I started asking people in the London office, I'd really like to go to Japan. And they said, no. 
they said, we have so much work for you here, because by now it was no longer a recession. By now it was 1999, and things were booming. I had internet skills. I was working at executive levels in telecom companies, helping them design internet offerings. And they didn't want me to go to Japan because that meant that they weren't able to put me on one of their projects. So I thought, how do I make this happen? So I started, um, we had an online system of all the projects that were being sold. And I found one that said Sony, Sony's internet strategy. And I thought, I think I could do Sony's internet strategy. So I looked up the partner's name. It was a guy named Greg Copy, and I'm being filmed, so I can't really lie about this. Greg Copy, if you see this one day, thank you for changing my life. Um, I called him up and I said, I've got all these relevant skills. I worked at British Telecom, France Telecom, Bouygues. I worked at Siemens. I worked at Marconi Communications. I think I could really help. He said, God, your skills sound amazing. We have a kickoff meeting where we're trying to get the sale closed. Again, I'll make up the dates. I don't remember exactly, but call it April 5th. And he said, uh, the kickoff meeting is April 5th in Tokyo. And uh, we'll know shortly after that whether or not we got the project. Thanks, Greg. Hung up the phone, and I booked a ticket, and I went to Tokyo. And I showed up at the Japanese office, and I said, I'm Mark Suster. I'm here for the Sony kickoff. And they look at me, and they went, like, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, Greg Copy told me that the kickoff was April 5th, which he did. I didn't say he told me to be here. I said, Greg Copy told me the meeting was on April 5th. So I showed up, and uh, they waited until it was the right time of day to call Greg in San Francisco. They called Greg. They put him on the phone. Greg said, what the hell are you doing there? I said, you told me the kickoff was April 5th. He said, but I didn't tell you to go there. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry. Well, I'm here. Do you want me to help? <laughs> I booked my own ticket on my own dollar. I promise you I didn't lie to him. Uh, if it was an error, it was an error of omission rather than commission. I just said, well, you told me the kickoff was April 5th. And I was betting on myself that if I got there, if I could find a way to get in front of these people and work my ass off by the end of it, I was betting that I at least had a decent shot that they would say, why don't you stay, which is actually what happened. So I worked there for a week. Uh, I stayed up late every night. I did as many slides as I could. I did anything they asked me to, and then Greg showed up the next week. Uh, we sold a project, and I got to work for the board of directors of Sony in 1999, which is when they wrote their very first internet strategy. So we wrote a position paper on what to do about broadband networks. We wrote a position paper on how to create IP-enabled devices, because back then most devices, I mean, uh, the Sony Walkman was what everybody used. There was no iPod. Uh, but we talked about IP enabling your devices. Um, and I actually told them in 1999, which wasn't an obvious idea, that I thought they should own a search engine and that I thought search would be the biggest metaphor for how people would discover content. Uh, and back then, there was a small search engine called Lycos that we could buy for about $2 billion. It ended up getting uh, bought by Telefonica. They didn't follow any of the advice, but I got to live and work in Japan. At the end of it, they actually offered for me to move permanently to Japan. I had been there for six months. Uh, by then, I was in my 30s. I was 30, exactly. And uh, I sort of had to choose between my then girlfriend, my now wife, so I made a very good decision, and Japan, and I decided to leave. I came back to London. And I was nine months away from making partner at Anderson, something I had worked at for nine years. And the golden handcuffs were feeling really, really tight. And I knew how much money was involved. And I knew that if I made partner, I was never going to leave. And I knew that I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy because as a consultant, you mostly do PowerPoint slides and analysis, I mean, after I stop programming. And you give advice to people who may or may not listen, and it's super interesting, and you get to travel, but you're not doing. You lose, like, the tangible sense of doing. And I really wanted to do, so I quit. And I went to work for almost no money. And I gave it all up, and I started my first company. 
Um, in 1999, just being honest, it wasn't like that big a leap to quit because if you were good at PowerPoint, you pretty much could raise money. And I'm pretty goddamn good at PowerPoint. So <laughs> I raised uh, $16.5 million for an A round, and I went on to build a software company. Um, I made about every mistake you can make as an entrepreneur because there were no blogs back then. There was no online advice. None of us knew what we were doing. No VCs told you what to do. Um, so I, the mistakes I made, I raised too much money, $16.5 million before you know what you're actually going to do is too much money. I hired too many people. Over the course of the next 18 months, I hired 129 people. I hired all the wrong people. I hired mostly people who look like me. Uh, a friend of mine once said it. He said, short guys hire short guys and tall guys hire tall guys. Um, and probably also the guys part is right. We hire too many guys. Um, and I learned over time that what you really want is a mix of people with different backgrounds and different experiences. And it turns out a bunch of type A consulting MBA types um, are not as good at sales and marketing and customer support and finance. Um, so I made every mistake. Um, we recovered from it. I went on to build a real business. We sold it to a French publicly traded company called The Sword Group. Um, and everything I learned, honestly, I learned from making mistakes. So I have this, I didn't put it in the presentation, but I have this um, talk I do called uh, Good Judgment Comes From Experience, but Experience Comes From Bad Judgment. So uh, good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. You actually have to make mistakes and do things and try. I bet on myself, which is why I learned the lessons. Um, I mentioned before that I have chutzpah, that I'm persistent, and that I'm mostly nice. Um, I wanted to teach you a concept I call polite persistence. If you're likable and you show up and you turn up and you're like, really? But then you're like, well, he's nice enough. Um, you achieve a lot in life. So I remember, and I'll tell you this story in a second, but when I was fundraising for my current venture capital fund, I remember trying to get the University of Virginia to take a meeting with me for a long time. Because when we raise money, we raise hundreds of millions of dollars. It tends to come from universities, from their endowments, uh, from foundations, from uh, big family offices, like multi-billionaires, from insurance companies, from pensions, from people who have billions of dollars. They put some of it in public equity, some of it in oil, some of it in real estate, and some of it into venture capital. So they build a portfolio. I had been trying to get the University of Virginia to take a meeting forever, and they, I just couldn't get them to take a meeting. So I called a friend of mine. He ran a fund called First Round Capital, and he had money from them, and he introduced me to the guy who manages their money. It's called a CIO, a chief investment officer, a guy named Rob Fair. And I said, Rob, I, I, I'm in Virginia for another meeting uh, in two days. Could you meet? He said, I'm really sorry. My calendar's booked the entire day, um, which is what everyone says when they really don't want to meet you. And I said, that's amazing. I'll bring you breakfast. What time should we start, 6.30 or 7? He gave me a 6 p.m. slot. I met him from 6 to 7.15. Uh, they did not give me money. Uh, eventually, he got replaced. Uh, it had nothing to do with him not giving me money. But over the years, I've built a pretty warm relationship with the University of Virginia. Whether they ever give me money or not, I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. I'm in the relationship business. I put myself out there. I build authentic relationships. If you do it for long enough and you're politely persistent, good things happen. So this is a story about how good things happened to me at my second company. So I had raised more than $60 million at my first company. My second company, I only raised 500,000. I just decided I didn't want all the money because all the money came with a lot of responsibilities I didn't want. Early on in my journey, I landed a customer and that customer was a tiny company that no one had ever heard of. Well, maybe some people had started to hear of, but it wasn't well known, called salesforce.com. And uh, salesforce.com, was using my software, but I heard that they were interested in buying somebody in my category. And I thought, if they're gonna buy someone, it should be me. And I, you know, I struggled to get them to return emails. 
So I would email them, I'd have to wait three days, then I'd get an email back, and then I'd send them back an immediate email, and it came back another three days. At the time I was living in Palo Alto, um, they were based in San Francisco. It's not that far, but it was far enough I didn't bump into them. So I decided the way to change the equation was to go and start working out of their building. And that's what I did. They were at one Market Street. There was a Starbucks in the lobby of one Market Street. They weren't that big a deal back then, I want to make that clear. But every member at salesforce.com went to that same Starbucks every day. Hey, Mark, what are you doing here? I got a meeting, and uh, you know, I'm going to be around. Hey, why don't you come up, meet a couple of the guys, whatever. Oh, sure. You know, and then I just started getting invited up. I started building my network. I started broadening my relationships. Benioff used to come. The founder used to come have coffee at the exact same place. I got to meet him several times. And then when they went to make a decision on who to buy, it was me versus a company called Spring CM based out of Chicago, and I had better relationships. It turns out relationships matter. But I was just politely persistent. I was the guy in the lobby of their coffee place every single morning. Um, get your foot in the door. My penultimate message. Um, after I sold my company to Salesforce, uh, Mark offered me a path to becoming CMO at Salesforce. I actually didn't think Salesforce was going to be that successful, so <laughs> I probably should have taken the job. But having, bless you, having been an entrepreneur for a long time, it was really hard for me to swallow going back to a big company and working for the man again. So I decided to leave. Again, betting on myself. And I called up a VC fund that had invested in me. And that VC fund um, is now called Upfront Ventures. We were called GRP at the time. And I called up the senior partner and founder, who's now my um, co-managing partner. And I said, um, Eve, just wanted to let you know I'm leaving Salesforce.com and I've been having a couple conversations with VCs about maybe joining. And Eve said to me, that's amazing. We would love to have someone with your background, your skills, your experience. We don't have any operators on staff. Would you consider talking to us? Now, Upfront is based in LA. I was living in Palo Alto. Um, I said, well, I'm open. I'll come down. I'll talk to you guys about it. And this is in 2007. And I started talking with the partners. And they had raised two funds, and they were going to raise their third fund, but they hadn't raised the new fund in eight years, which is a really long time. And there's a reason, because in 2003, 4, 5, and 6, nobody believed in venture capital anymore, if you can believe that. Nobody cared about startups. Nobody cared about venture capital. Everybody thought the internet was a hoax. It, wasn't, it was going to go away. All this money was wasted on dot com. Um, so they had a hard time raising a fund. And I talked to one of the partners there, and uh, I said, well, Eve really wants me to join as a partner. What do you think? And he said, I, I don't know. He said, it sounds like a good idea, but we have to raise a new fund first. And I said, uh, okay, well, why is that? He said, well, we don't really have the fees to pay you. I mean, we could pay you, but we couldn't pay you a lot. And uh, I said, well, how much? And he threw out the number. It was kind of a lot. Um, but he said, I, I would feel badly paying you that, that amount of money. That's not what you should make as a partner. And I said, well, guess what? The alternative is me making zero. Because if I don't join you, I'm going to start a company and make zero. So whatever you're paying me is more than zero. And he said, well, I feel badly, and we wouldn't be able to give you a lot of upside. We'd only be able to give you this tiny amount of carry. Carries the upside in venture. And I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? If I get my foot in the door as a VC, no one ever gives you a job as VC. Will, what did I say? How hard is it to get into VC? Yeah, it's pretty impossible. So thank you. You answered that correctly. And uh, it's very hard, and I thought, if I get in, and if I'm any good at it, once I'm in, then you're always a VC, and I could tell everyone I'm a VC, and if it doesn't work out here, I've been a VC, it'll work out somewhere else. I just need someone to give me a chance. 
Now, the other VCs I was talking to, they were offering me jobs, but not jobs to be an investment partner. They wanted me to be an EIR, Entrepreneur in Residence, or an operating partner to help give advice, um, or maybe one level below partner. I didn't want to do I was done proving myself. I was 39. And uh, so I said, you know what? I'll take that offer. And he felt bad about it, but I already told you I'm politely persistent pain in the ass, and so I forced it. And my mentality was this, and I actually said this out loud to them. If you raise your third fund, you're going to turn around and do a search process, and you're going to go look for someone else, and you're going to try to hire someone who already has VC experience, and I don't have VC experience. So let me join now, and I'll help you raise the fund. And if I'm right, pay me back all the wages you would have paid me. And they said yes. And that's how I got into venture capital. And I always remembered that story because about three years later, I went to hire an intern. And we we did raise the fund, and I did help them. And we didn't have a lot of budgets for interns. And I said to this, um, he actually, he was graduating his second year of Stanford MBA. And I said, I'll give you an internship. He said, I need a job. I said, I don't have a job. I have an internship. If it goes well, who knows? He said, I can't do it. I need a job. I said, you want to work in venture capital? He said, yes, it's my dream job. I said, do you have any other venture capital offers? He says, no. I said, well, why would you turn me down? And he said, because I need a job, and if I'm seen to take an internship at the end of my second year, I'm concerned about how people will perceive me. I said, okay. So six months later, he called me, and he said, okay, I want to take the internship. I said, it's not on offer anymore. What you proved to me was you weren't confident enough betting on yourself. And I did. And that's the difference between you and me. I don't mean to be an ass about it, but I opened the door for you. No one opened the door for me. You didn't take it. Uh, No idea what happened to the guy. (laughs) AOC. Anyone heard of AOC? Not very many people. Really? Try again. AOC? AOC? Wow, you guys, I guess they're studying uh, entrepreneurship and not politics. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, have you heard of that? Still not that many. Shame on you. Um, Whether you politically are aligned with her or not is not my point. I think she's 29. And outside of LMU, the whole world has heard of her. (laughs) And... uh, She has a unique moment in time where she's putting herself out there in the spotlight and building a brand for herself. That brand, that connection with the direct audience is power. It's power. I don't know if she'll use it responsibly or not use it responsibly, but I will tell you that's how Donald Trump became president. He understood the power of building a direct relationship with followers in an audience that believed in what he believed. He created authenticity for what they wanted to hear. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez is not waiting in the back of the line to say, I need 15 years experience before I get to do this. 15 years from now, no one will care. She has her moment. She's taking it. There's a reason I talk about these two people. It has nothing to do with politics. I actually don't agree with either of their politics. It's about building a personal brand. When I got into venture capital, it was impossible to become known. The way you succeeded in venture capital was you were a white, male, engineer, out of Stanford, grew up, knew all the professors there, and you got your deal flow. It, it was a total white man boys club. Um, I am a man, I am white, um, but that's all that I had in that inner circle. And the venture capital funds that have been around for 30 years, you, the names people knew, I'm not gonna test you because if you don't know AOC, you wouldn't know John Doerr or Mike Moritz or any of these people. I didn't wanna wait in line. I decided to create a blog called Both Sides of the Table. I decided to be public and create a Twitter handle and put out tweets. I know it's kind of obvious now. I promise you people weren't doing this in 07, 08, 09, 2010. I started going on the news, taking interviews, and very quickly built myself to be the second most read blog on venture capital and entrepreneurship in the industry in less than two years. 
And then people started associating my name with Fred Wilson, who is the guy who funded Twitter, very successful venture capitalist, and a guy named Brad Feld, because they were the only other people who were out publicly telling you how to do entrepreneurship and be a VC. And it was Fred Wilson, Brad Feld, Mark Suster. I hadn't achieved what they had. I was a brand new VC, but I knew how to anchor my brand and my reputation to other people who were doing this. I created both sides of the table. I didn't create LAVC. That wasn't what I was trying to achieve. I wanted entrepreneurs who thought, when I raise money, I want to raise money from someone who walked in my shoes. LAVC wouldn't do that. Both sides of the table would. And I started writing about life on the venture capital side, life on the entrepreneurship side. When blogging became passe or everyone was doing it and it was harder to differentiate, I already had, I don't know, I have like um, 20,000 people who just read my newsletter and I read about really boring stuff like how to, how to run effective board meetings. But my influence, if I write about Disney, it will end up on Bob Iger's desk because when you build a readership and you write about something, I'm one connection away from just about anybody. And it creates, what I'm competing for is share of mind. People's brains, share of mind. And how do you do that as an individual unless you're willing to put yourself out there? And uh, if you ever read this book, Outliers, um, Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote about this topic of 10,000 hours in developing competence. Because I've been writing so much over the years, you become good at it and you know what to talk about, how to make mis not make mistakes, and you develop competence. And when everyone was doing that, I switched to Snapchat. And I started creating something called Snap Stories, Snap Storms, where I would do little videos filming myself talking about how to build a brand, how to hire people, how to fire people, how to raise capital. Um, I didn't show any cleavage. <laughs> I didn't worry if my hair was messy. I'm kind of boring. And it became a really funny thing because all these people were like, I don't know, 23, sending stuff of their friends partying. I always remember this guy wrote me, he said, I used to watch you in bed and I'd be watching entrepreneurship advice and my wife was looking at me like, who's that crazy white guy you're listening to? He's an old man or whatever. Because it was like so discontinuous from <coughs> everything else they were doing on Snapchat. And I built hundreds of thousands of followers. My kids think it's funny because I would go, I don't know, to Universal Studios or do a big soccer match and people would always come up to me because they just recognized that, that old guy on Snapchat. But um, I stopped doing it, you know, kind of dropped the mic, but it's possible to build a brand and create awareness if you're willing to start and try and learn. So those are my six stories. I don't want to belabor them because I do want to take a few questions before I run out the clock. Anyone have questions? It can be on any topic right here. Um, going back, you're doing this, I want to compliment your shoes. It's awesome. Thank you. Very great pair. Um, Appreciate it. What made us bet on something that's so niche as a uh, sneaker marketplace? I bet on a restaurant reservation booking app. I bet on these really amazing product people, and the app didn't work. And my partner, Greg, was at eBay, and he said sneakers are the fastest growing category of collectibles. And eBay can't do them because um, most sneakers on eBay are counterfeits. So if you could solve that problem, you could solve it. So the way GOAT works is you sell your sneakers, you send it to GOAT, GOAT inspects it, verifies it, looks at the manufacturing, and if they authenticate it, they then uh, send it to the buyer. And that's how it took off. And by the way, not so niche, hundreds of millions of sales. What else? Other questions? While you're thinking, I'll tell you a quick story about how I bought this pair of shoes. Uh, it came from a Super Bowl bet. I bet on the Rams and the Patriots, mostly because I hate the Patriots, but I thought it would be nice to bet on the local team. And the wrong team won. And I promised my partner who's from Boston I would buy him a pair of Robert Kraft Patriots shoes. They used to have a big you know, Patriots logo on the back. I think he's having to cut off the bit that says Robert Kraft. And 
So, so while I was there wasting my money on him, he sent me a link and said, you should get this to make yourself feel better. Yeah. Yeah. I am an Eagles fan. Uh, born in Philly. My mom is from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, I moved to California when I was three. My dad's from South America, so I'm a Jutino. And uh, uh, he's from uh, Medellin, Colombia. He came to Philadelphia for business school, so he taught at Hahnemann. And uh, so when I grew up, I grew up in Sacramento. And back then, the Kings weren't there. We had no local sports teams. So I grew up hardcore like my parents, Phillies and Eagles fan. And, and the Eagles won. Uh, no, they were in the Super Bowl when I was a kid, 1980. Uh, they won the World Series that year, and then we had a horrendous time until last year. So it took 49 years of pain, but they won last year. I see Villanova. Are you from Philly? Yeah. Awesome. Are you a Birds fan? Sure. Go Birds! You shared a lot about some of the big successes. What have been some of your... You shared a lot about the big successes. Yeah. What have been some of your setbacks, and how did you overcome them? Um, I'd say almost everything I've done has been a setback. And that's the, I mean, every, raising money, I, I made every mistake, everything was a setback. I talk a lot about what it takes to be an entrepreneur publicly. Um, you need resilience. And you need uh, ability to overcome adversity. And it'll sound cliche when I say it, but adversity is really a lesson for learning and teaching you to get better at things. And, you know, the whole idea of startups and entrepreneurship these days is like create an experiment, test it, see what works, make it a little bit better, create an experiment, test it, see what works, makes it a little bit better. I'd say that's my whole life experience is making little small experiments and testing and trying but still keeping a smile on my face and uh, deeply ethical but willing to push boundaries. And I know it's a really tough line because I know when I tell the Japan story, some people just think, oh, Mark, you're a terrible person. On the other hand, I went to Japan and you didn't, um, and, uh, and, I, and I don't lie. Um, but I'm willing to push boundaries, and I think if you push boundaries and you test and you're like, honestly, I've done things where I'm like, God, I wish I didn't do that, but I'm also willing to acknowledge it, apologize, show humility, make it up to people. Uh, but that's kind of my life story. I don't think there's not one big arc where I can say I was so amazing at X that I put myself in this position. It really has been incremental. And I think that's the story of most people, to be honest with you. There are very few LeBrons, you know, that are just born, whether it's your brain or your brawn, that are just born like Elon Musk, just born with extraordinary talent. There's very few of those people. And for everyone else, it's hard work. What else? Back here, Dodgers hat. Jose. I know you've invested in a lot of technology companies, but I wanted to know what inspired Upfront to invest in a media company like Me Too. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. So Me Too is a Latino media company. Um, I had first invested in a company called Maker Studios. Um, I'm not a media guy. I'm a tech guy. Uh, what interested me about this town was how little innovation there had been in the media industry using technology to, to serve audiences with digital media better. When I backed Maker Studios, they were doing zero revenue. Um, it was 12 people. Uh, four and a half years later, we sold to Disney for $760 million. I was the largest shareholder and chairman, not chairman of the board, I was the lead director. Having done that, I saw one mistake that I thought we made at Maker, which I believe the best brands serve endemic audiences, meaning we create content and experience or a product for a group of people that we serve better than anybody else. And Maker Studios was trying to serve everything to everybody. So I really wanted to serve what I considered an underserved vertical. I came very close to funding a company called Tastemade. Does anyone know Tastemade? So they're in the food genre. Um, but I was super interested in this idea of Latino media, mostly because of my father's background. So I grew up in a uh, bilingual home. I myself am not bilingual, but my father to this day mostly only speaks Spanish. Uh, I grew up with weird music, weird food, weird cultural stuff. If you've ever seen, um, I think it was uh, the Joy Luck Club. Did anyone see that? 
and they talk about the unique experience of wanting to feel American, wanting to throw your roots behind you and pretend like you're like everybody else, but secretly you're not because you eat empanadas or platanos or, you know, this weird shit. <laughs> That's my life experience. And I look around and there are no Latino directors, actors, writers, no media authentically speaking to that audience. And I think there, that opportunity exists. I met a team of people that I thought had unique experiences to build that. We went like this, and then we kind of went like this, and we're now in our kind of second arc. Um, to this day, I think Latinos, about 70, it's, I know it's not a, um, a, a single um, uh, demographic in the US because it's broken down by, eth, you know, by, by country, by background, but about 17% of the US. Uh, and in terms of media representation, like two to three percent. So I think there's a really big opportunity, multi-billion dollar opportunity there. Um, we made some mistakes in serving that, but I, I still have the aspiration to do that. So that's really what drove me is personal experience and a belief that there was an untapped market. And, and the way we're trying to fulfill that is moving away from advertising and more towards... Um, uh, building pro authentic products for people, and we're focusing more on Mexican Americans than trying to be broad for everyone. So we launched a, a, a product called, um, uh, let me just think of it for a minute, it's called Barrio, Barrio Box, and so we're trying to create unique physical experiences uh, to differentiate ourselves so we don't have to rely on advertising. One, one more question, one, two more questions? Last question. last question, okay, right over here. Yeah. The all-time hardest moment as an entrepreneur is the question, and I know without even thinking about it what it was. Um, in two, late 2000, um, we were running out of money, and by then the bloom had already come off the dot-com rose, and no one was able to raise money, and I was feeling the pressure uh, so much so that I was having stress problems. I was seeing a doctor. I thought I had heart problems. Um, I had 129 people's lives that I was responsible for. We had about 30 contractors on top of that, so about 159 people. And the hard thing about being an entrepreneur is from day one when you raise money, there's a clock ticking on your death. You raise 18 months cash. You're two months in. You're 16 months away from being dead. And every month that passes, you feel that sense of impending doom. Believe me, if you talk to any entrepreneur, they feel it. But you can't show it to anybody else because you can't show up at the office and tell normal people like, oh my God, I'm so panicked. I don't know if we're going to survive. I have people come to me and they say, I'm thinking about taking a mortgage out. What do you think? I'm like, bad idea. <laughs> Terrible. Don't do it. Um, but I don't say that. I say I like the flexibility of not being locked into a mortgage. <laughs> um, it's, re, it's like absorbing stress. And so what I decided to do was to merge with another company, which is a terrible idea, but I didn't know it back then. I found an Israeli company. My company was called Build Online. They had a company called iScraper. And I decided if we merged the two companies together, we could each cut 50% of our costs and I could take their investors and my investors, raise more money, and become the winner. And so my investors were Goldman Sachs, um, Bank of America, but also some VCs across Europe. Their investor was a very big private equity firm called Apex Partners. And we did all the plans. We worked on it for weeks. We did a combined business plan. I presented to their team. They presented to my team. I canceled vacation with my family. Uh, I wasn't married yet, but my mom had organized for us to go to Hawaii for Thanksgiving. I didn't go. I, you know, just literally had nothing but getting this done. And about three weeks from close, I, I even remember the names. It was that devastating. This guy, Metin Negrin, called me up and said, we're pulling out of the deal. 
And I said, what the fuck? What do you mean you're pulling out of the deal? He said, Apex decided to fund us without you. They were playing us. They figured that if they ran us all the way to the very end and we ran out of cash, they could pick up our assets for free. Yeah. Welcome to the world. Uh, I remember the name. Uh, so th with three weeks cash left, there's nothing you can do. So I did pull my executive team together. We went to a pub. It was 10, 1030 in the morning and we started drinking pints of beer. Did I mention I like beer? <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, it was England. It was more a part of the culture. And I literally sat everyone down and I said, we're gonna go bankrupt. We've never been through this before. I've never been through this before. Let's plan out how it's gonna work. Um, by then, you know, I was on my way to being engaged to be married. I was a failure. I was thinking that my wife's family is going to think what a fool she is. Um, but all I just kept thinking was, how do I protect these people, protect this job, protect this company? Um, and midway through that meeting, two pints in, I got a phone call from one of my investors who said, you've shown so much resilience in the last five months, we're not gonna let this be a setback, we're gonna fund you anyway. So uh, they gave me $10 million. We landed on the front page of the Financial Times. I still have a copy of it framed. Uh, nobody was raising money back then. Um, absolute low point, combined with then still having to bring my staff in and go from 129 people down to 38 in one day. Looking at people cry, grown people cry, losing their jobs, feeling devastated. But I knew the 38 people that went into the boat were actually going to go on to build something of substance. And if we didn't do it, we were all going to slowly die. And that was like a really terrible moment. Having been through that, I think makes me a better investor because there's very few investors who have been, I've been through a lot of moments like that. And, you know, if anyone catches me again, I'll tell you 15 more stories, which one day hopefully will wind up in a book. Um, but it's that level of hitting rock bottom and still being able to move forward and realize that I, I, at that moment, I just said, well, here's another life lesson. I'm going to learn how to do bankruptcy. <laughs> And, uh, and that was the worst moment. So anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate it.